You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 33 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. With me as always, opening a beer, <laughs> is Chairman Lowe. What's up? That really does sound like you should be leading a communist country, Chairman Lowe. <laughs> czar. The planning czar. Matt Newlow. Right. Matt Lee. Oh, yeah. Man, I haven't heard from him lately. And slumming, as always... Jessica Salagi. Hello. Well, Matt, you know, something last week happened that had me fall off my couch laughing on Facebook. Oh, yeah? One of the most respected men in our county, probably the most respected man in our county, our sheriff, took to Facebook to (laughs) troll you. Right. (laughs) This was not the sheriff's department's PAO or anybody else. This was his personal page. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. And Jessica, you're picking up the uh, the troll vibe now by using cogent arguments to discuss why a Supreme Court nominee may not be the perfect candidate. I am. I'm well hated by everyone at this point. It's obviously, it's obviously, it's impossible to both disagree with the treatment of somebody and disagree with their judicial record. Correct. You cannot, um, you cannot believe that somebody is a piss poor judge and also be disappointed with the way that the process has taken place. Apparently you can't even be upset that we're not talking about a judicial record, that we're talking about all this other stuff. That's that's also wrong. So, I well, I'll tell you, la- last week, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, talked about the mistreatment. And I thought, I, if I was in a deli and we ordered the same sandwich, I ordered the same sandwich as, as Ginsburg, I would think I was wrong. <laughs> And I, I, I was shocked to agree with her on anything. Right. <laughs> so oh. I've been questioning my uh, uh, my life choices at this point. How long do you think she's going to hold on? I think she's full of formaldehyde. I think Disney got a hold of her and put animatronics in her. So forever? Forever. She's basically the Abraham Lincoln when you go through oh, the whole presidents. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> You don't like Abraham Lincoln? I don't. He's a tyrant and a monster. And if he'd been my president at the time I was alive, I'd be sandwich sign marching in the street. (laughs) I was going to make a very distasteful joke, and I'm glad I didn't. (laughs) Just give it time. I'm sure another one will come around by the time the show's over. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Give it 30 seconds. Too soon, too soon. Before we get into everything, I wanted to offer a little update on our buddy Chris Severe. Because he's Oh, been, excellent. He's been busy in Louisiana. Have you guys heard what he's been up to? No. He's been super busy. So he <laughs> filed a federal lawsuit in southern Louisiana um, seeking... T- was this in federal court? <laughs> I think it was on Facebook, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> right. Seeking to stop... Um, a drag queen story time. And he says that the event violates the first amendment. And he asked the judge to prevent the program from taking place, which is supposed to take place, I believe on Friday or Saturday of this week. Um, so I haven't heard if the judge has ruled in his favor or what, but of course now like that people were hearing about him, his old mug shots are circulating and everyone's talking about how he's not licensed to practice law in Louisiana and he has a history of burying his computer and everything and his stalking charges. But, um, yeah, what do you think about that? What do you think about the fact that he says that drag queen story time violates the First Amendment? I don't know. I Go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, I would think that telling a drag queen they can't 
do story time would be the violation of the First Amendment. Not right. <clears throat> I, 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 I don't know if it's great, wholesome family fun, but it certainly doesn't violate the First Amendment. <laughs> Man, I got a couple of my kids I'd take to that. <laughs> Just so they could heckle it. <laughs> no, I... You know, as an adult, there's nothing wrong with a drag show. No, man, was it uh, was it uh, Backstreet? Was that the was that the club in Atlanta that had the the drag show? I don't know, Matt. Was it? I, I'm, I'm asking y'all. I'm not saying I ever went. I'm just <laughs> asking. <laughs> hey, first of all, I like having a drink bought for me every once in a while. No, there were several places you could go. Uh, Charlie Brown's Cabaret. Is what his uh, what it was, I believe. That was a that was a drag famous drag show. But as far as the First Amendment, parents if that's what they want to take their kids to go, go do. I, I don't understand how it violates anything constitutionally. Right. I just think it's so funny that you know he just goes from state to state, and these articles continue to pop up investigating his past, talking about the thing with the country music star and the young girl and, you know, marrying his computer and him being an objectophile, a self-identified objectophile. And this thing with his legal, I mean, if none of that happened, the thing with his legal career and being disbarred totally discredits him on its own. And every article references it. Like this one here says, um, from the advertiser in Louisiana, it says that, it's quoting the decision where it says that he's incapacitating from continuing to practice law for reason of mental infirmity or illness. And then, of course, he told the paper that it's because um, he's a whistleblower and a Christian, and so the Tennessee Board of Professional Responsibility unethically targeted him. (laughs) (laughs) Because the Bible Belt is known for persecuting Christians. Right, especially Christian lawyers. I hear that they are, who, who, yeah, I, I got nothing, but it's just, it, I mean, it is fascinating to me. I would be mortified if one state had all these articles on me, let alone like half in the union. Well, right. in Louisiana, I don't, I'm sure it has changed, but for a long time did not require a law school to take the bar. That's true. I was going to say that. That's where Frank Abagnale went to practice law. Uh, that's the based the character based on a true guy and catch me if you can and yet he's still not licensed to practice law there yeah they'll take the fraud yeah, back, you... but chris severe needs to go well i mean i kind of agree but... <laughs> <laughs> no no he's he's a, a great punching bag for the show and deserves <laughs> every every bit of it i just wanted to provide an update i'll try to be more diligent about following him around the nation i mean the most exciting time to to follow him is obviously in the spring when he's traveling to legislatures but ah spring yeah i expect something to be back this year and i expect someone with a little more clout obviously paulette won't be be carrying anything except thank god um but i'm expecting somebody to carry some porno legislation it's for the. It'll be Unterman. Yeah, it's for the children. Mm, yep. Unterman, bless her heart. <laughs> all right, so that's all I have to say about Chris, who they reference as Chris Severe, Chris Sevier, Mark. They're like he has all these aliases. Well, he went to Sevier <laughs> when he went to Louisiana. Right. Right. And then he like from Alabama. Yeah, but he lived in think, Tennessee for a from. long time. That's where he was disbarred and tried to get married. And he tried to get married in Texas, too. Right. So. Texas, you say? Don't we have a story out of Texas? We, what I was going to say is, you know, as a, a freedom-minded person, I don't think... If he came at it from the standpoint of the government shouldn't be legitimizing any relationship, that would be interesting. But that's not his, uh, not his point. No, no, right. it isn't. Well, speaking of people who are more resilient than they should be, 
There's a story of a man who's been bitten by a bear and pretty yeah, severely <laughs> drug out of his tent. The bear chewed on his skull and let him go. Uh, he walked away from it with uh, a minor injuries, a great story of hearing the teeth scraping against his skull. Well, I guess he decided to get away from bears and went to Hawaii to surf where he was bitten by a shark. <laughs> Probably chewed on by sharks. <laughs> All in the same year. That is one delicious like, man. Right. Well, see, here's the thing, man, is like, like you're, the odds of that, of either one of those, are astronomical. Right? Like they, and, and now it, this poor dude's had both. He should As, play the lottery. Right? Um, man. And he's, I don't know, like, I think that there's, like, I think there's certain people that are at higher risk to be bitten by these animals. You mean, you know? like, the people like, who spend a lot of time around them? Yeah, like, look, I'm not a diver, right? I don't, I don't dive, I don't go to the beach very often, but dudes that that dive for a living or something like that. Like, I kind of expect them to be in a high-risk group, you know? So when you hear about a professional diver that got, you know, gnawed on by a shark, it doesn't really shock me. It's kind of like when you hear about a hunter that gets chewed up by a bear, you know? They're running around the woods, they're sneaking around, they're making animal noises, you know? But this poor dude, man, he was just... I don't. I, he doesn't. I don't think he was in either high risk group, and he managed to get both. That's well. In both instances, something else. There are poor decisions you can make. One being having open food in your tent, something that smells delicious. Uh, as far as shark attacks go, you know, I spent a lot of time on the water. I spear fish. Uh, I was at the beach last week. Because my boat wasn't working, so I was sitting in the sand, say, steaming. Not in your boat. Yeah, and I'm watching these people swim through what I what fishermen call balls of bait. It's big schools of bait fish that are balled up because there are predators near them, and these people just think it's the most amazing thing in the world to see birds picking up, picking fish off the surface and and these balls of bait going all around them. And like, I'm not saying that there's. It was a shark, but there's something eating those finger mullet, causing them to ball up. So right. if you're making poor decisions in in wild, because you, you enter the food chain when you get in the water. You enter the food chain when you go into the woods to a certain certain extent. You're not you're not the apex predator. And if you make poor decisions, bad things happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. Man. You know, and I'm not saying that's what the guy did. I have no idea. Uh, right. Yeah. No, he was just, I think they said he was surfing and, and a shark came up and bit him. Now I saw the, the video and, and he had a very, like, I mean, he was bit, no doubt about it, on his calf. But, you know, like it didn't bite a chunk off or anything. They stitched up all the teeth marks and wrapped the eighth bandage around, bandage around it and sent him home. So it wasn't like a you know some kind of full blown attack where he's missing half his leg or something like that. But well, shark attacks are very rarely attacks. They are almost always mistaken identity. Right, a tasting. Yeah, you, a sampling. You hang your your limbs off of a board, and your hands and feet being you know tan, especially if you're hanging out in Hawaii, tan on top and white on bottom, looks a lot like a fish, a struggling fish as you're kicking and swimming around. And you are doing everything that I do as a fisherman to attract a bite by a predator. So a shark will go up and bite you. Not that I have any experience being bitten by a shark. Taste you, realize that, or realize that you're either the pole and, and realize, hey, this is way bigger than I intended and let go. Or they'll taste you and go, ah, this, this is not fish at all. This tastes like crap. And let you go right. and, and swim on. Uh, even a minor bite is... is stitches because their teeth or rates are sharp and you know it's a traumatic event for the person but it's not a I as a uh, uh, saltwater enthusiast I hate the word attack 
This is not truly attack. It it was a mistaken identity. The shark let him go. It wasn't like it wasn't malicious, and and went on. Now what the bear did, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I mean that one did. You know, drag him out of the tent by his head. Yeah, there was a bear attack. Uh, and that was a legit, legitimate attack. They killed the guy. Uh, it was a guide in Wyoming two weeks ago, I think. Um, well, it's also the difference between a grizzly attack and a black bear attack. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, but, you know, if a black bear attacks, typically, like if, if, it, if, it, if especially if it's not a case of mistaken identity, I mean, you better fight because they mean it. Uh, particularly if you're between a, a bear, a mama bear, and her cubs, that's they are very territorial and uh, instinctive to to protect. But again, that goes to poor decision making. Right. Yeah. No. There's a photographer that I follow out of uh, out of Alaska, and he was photographing a black bear, and he got too close. And the black bear let him know. And that it is the oh coolest picture. Like, you know, and to read his... I just sent it to you guys. We'll post it on the on the page later. Like, I, to see that bear snarl up like that, you know, he clearly was letting the guy know, hey, you have invaded my space. I need you to go away. But his little write-up about it, about, you know, backing out and... And really being scared at that point was cool, but you know, there's a a uh, place in North Carolina where my grandmother grew up called Shit Bridges Creek, and the story is a hunter encountered a bear, and that's where he cleaned out his pants. <laughs> and it's somewhere near Asheville. Really? Yep. <laughs> Quick, everyone listening, Google shit Bridges Creek. I don't know if it exists. It, it could be renamed like they're doing to Confederate Avenue downtown. Who knows? But that was uh, one of the stories she would tell often. Oh. Well, moving on. It exists. It exists. <laughs> it exists. <laughs> so I'm not. Southeast, southeast uh, Buncombe County. Bernie Mountain. Flows northwest into Cane Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Animals of different type in San Antonio, Texas. A gentleman's club is looking to open with the name Emergency Room. And local <laughs> residents are afraid that injured people will be confused and t- go to the wrong location. I mean, are they worried that when you punch in in your navigation that, that that's what they're going to do? Because I've never done that. I've only typed in, like, hospital or urgent care. I've never typed in emergency room. But, I I mean, I'm looking at my phone right now, and if you type in emergency, emergency room, emergency vet, emergency dental, like, all these things come up. But those are, like, a type of thing, not a place. And, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, man. It might could filter out some of the folks that are really hurt and the ones that are faking. There you go. It would totally cut down on like wrong insurance claims or someone, you know, they show up at the, right. the bar and just get just get lit. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's cheaper. I need a flu shot. My chest pains. My chest pains went away. I'll have a beer and a lap dance. <laughs> <laughs> he died with a smile on his face. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how many. Oh, times that would be I... fun headlines, though. Man dies of heart attack in emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently the sign. You're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> how funny would that be if a guy died in the emergency room? Appar- uh, apparently, they are <laughs> facing a three hundred dollar fine. Yes, three hundred dollars. For not having a sign permit and just popping the sign up there. And I guess that's how people got to know the name of the of the club itself. I'm sure with all the paperwork it is, you know, 
whatever ink uh, doing I mean, business as. What more do these people want? You know, they don't want the XXX on the sign. They don't want the girl on the pole. I mean, what what is acceptable? And then they're going to charge because they don't have the right permit. You know, I was a nanny in college, and the little girls were three and five. <laughs> and I remember we were going to the bowling alley on Piedmont Avenue, and we were sitting at a red light, and, you know, on Piedmont, there's, like, a lot of strip clubs. And there was right. a girl, like, it was the white sign with the black outline, the girl on the pole. And the littler girl was like, oh, wow, look how fancy she is. And the five-year-old who'd had a year in pre-K already in kindergarten was like, oh, honey, no, 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 honey, no. <laughs> Well, she is kind of fancy. You know, this she, one chance fancy, don't let me down. Right. But she's like, oh, wow, she's so fancy. So, I mean, like, who cares? The best example is South Georgia, as you take uh, 75 South. And there's a big sign that's just blacked out with white letters that says, Strippers, need we say more? I haven't seen that it, one. I think they're coming down because the, the local folk are all upset about it, but... Every time I drive down there, I'm like, yeah, I do need to know a little bit more. <laughs> what I mean, kind of strip? Right. Yeah, I right. mean. Are we talking the cheetah caliber of strippers or what's that one over a uh, Claremont Lounge? <laughs> no, the Claremont Lounge is there for entertainment. So did you know that they like totally built a nice bar and restaurant above the Claremont Lounge now that is like a hip place to go for young people and then everyone like rolls downstairs when they're toasted to see 90 year old strippers I think she's 70 you talk about Blondie yeah yeah I think she's 70 look Marilyn Manson when he's in town hangs out there Mumford and Sons I think it was got thrown out of there Uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, was there at at some point it's it's one of those oddity things of Atlanta that kind of is a shame that's getting gentrified right and I've threatened to go many nights. I've never been to the Claremont Lounge. I've, I've driven by it because there's a Home Depot right across the street when I'm working in town. No, we should all go next time Jessica's in town. I'd rather not. Oh, you don't want to see Blondie crush a PBR can? Nope. <laughs> I wouldn't mind going to my grave not seeing that. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> to the grave not seeing that. Right? <laughs> I mean, there has to be a little P.T. Barnum in you. I mean, just the greatest show on earth, the, the freak show. I mean, you, I, from what I understand, it ranks right up there with the bearded lady. No? Nope. Jessica's just all yeah. no, man. Jessica's Hard. checked out. Hard pass. <laughs> Hard pass. See? I don't know, man. I guess I'm a little more like, yeah, I'd watch that. <laughs> <laughs> So, in uh, Pensacola, very near where I fish, beachgoers were surprised to see an eastern diamondback swim up on shore. Holy. Okay. So, look. Like, I I obviously hang out in places where snakes exist, and I don't typically mess with them. I know we, we last week we talked about that I killed one. Um, so we could eat it, and that was a rattlesnake. But I normally just leave them alone because, you know, that's the thing. But, like, did, we were just talking about sharks, right? So now i got to worry about rattlesnakes in the ocean, too? I, so I just love how this article on Fox News, which was actually quoting the Pensacola News Journal, says that the snake appeared to be exhausted and trying to keep its head above water. So... Were the people on the beach snake experts? Because how do you know if a snake is exhausted? Lethargic, I would think. Again, what does that even mean? They move slow, they move fast. They slither, they don't slither. It would be my guess that even with 80 degree temperature water, uh, snakes being cold-blooded, 
The water dissipates heat something like five times faster. I should know that as an AC guy. I should know that number better. I should say it more confidently. Uh, so right. it probably was less exhausted and more cold. I mean, they're cold-natured creatures. Uh, I don't think this is that unusual. It may No, it's not. I've seen stories of this before out of, uh, like, in the Outer Banks. Yeah, I mean, they get sucked out uh, with a storm. Um, for whatever reason, or they, they, they may c- c- crawl into the hull of a boat in a backwater somewhere and, uh, wake up offshore. <laughs> right. Uh, and, <laughs> or get, or get found. <laughs> yeah. You don't really want to shoot the one in the hole of your boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, man, that would put my mom in a precarious predicament. Like, she would not, she is, this woman's deathly afraid of snakes, and she doesn't do, like, saltwater fish at all. <laughs> that would put her in this weird, do I leap from the boat <laughs> into the into the sharks or hang out with the snake? <laughs> this photo, though, from Facebook that they're talking about in the article, I mean, it's terrifying. It's not a baby snake. It's a full-grown snake. Like, right. Oh, yeah, it's big. I don't know that, unlike, you know, Pacific green snakes that are that hunt in the water, that uh, rattlesnakes are going to go straight to biting you uh, in the water. I, I think their, their primary drive would not be to eat or defend itself, but to find someplace dry and warm. Okay, well, why don't you go swim with the rattlesnakes and see if that's how it turns out? I prefer the sharks. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Matt, you're talking about your mom. My wife is deathly afraid of snakes, and she drove into the garage and saw one. And, of course, summoned me. It was a rat snake. And yells at me to shoot it. (laughs) That woman wanted me to discharge a firearm (laughs) in my own home to kill a harmless snake. And she was mad when I ushered it out the door to go and do what it does, which is kill rodents. Right. <laughs> she would have been perfectly happy if I hit the snake and ricocheted off the concrete floor and took a piece of me on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a really good time before we start. That these are our opinions. Not necessarily the opinions of all in Georgia or any sane, rational person. We started last week with Amendments 1 and 2. I guess that means we're going into 3, 4, and 5. If the count at Sesame Street taught me anything, yes. Great. Excellent. Speaking of Sesame Street, did you hear recently that the creator of Bernie... Or Bert and Ernie confirmed that they were, in fact, gay lovers. You know, I did hear that. And the story was, like, talking about how he didn't want people to lose sleep over it anymore. And I was thinking, like, I remember being little and my mom telling me that they were gay. And, (laughs) like, it was just something I assumed from a young age. And I didn't lose any sleep over it. Did people lose sleep over that? I didn't, but I like, I never, like, I, I don't know that I ever wasted time worrying about the sexual orientation of a puppet. You wasted your life. No, it, <laughs> it, and as a kid, it, it didn't occur to me at all. I mean, I shared a room with my little right. brother. I mean, it just, it didn't, it didn't occur to me that it was anything more than, you know, a, a goofy guy and a, and a serious guy. It just, it it didn't register, I guess, and that's, uh, I guess I was more naive. Was Sesame yeah, Street was... around when you were growing up? Yeah, they had, uh, uh, it was, you know, the 70s, so everybody had great big afros and bell bottoms. Are you telling the truth? Yeah. No, I actually, yeah, the early, like when I first started, my earliest yeah. memories of being like three or four years old. Yeah, it was 1980, 81, and the opening credits were still from like 68. Right. 
because they didn't change the opening credits for probably 20 years. Sesame Street and then uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That was my favorite shows when I was a kid. All right, well. Uh-oh. Here. What? Nothing. My, my lack of use of technology. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended so as no. to revise provisions related to the subclassification for tax purposes of and for the prescribed methodology for establishing the value of forest land conservation use property and related assistance grants to provide that assistance grants related to forest land conservation use property may be increased by general law for a five-year period and that up to 5% of assistance grants may be deducted and retained by the state revenue commissioner to provide for certain state <laughs> administrative costs and to provide for the subclassification of qualified timberland property for ad valorem tax purposes. Okay, so no one in their right mind can tell me that these questions are written for the people in the best interest of the people and for the purposes of crafting good law. Right, yeah, I don't even know. Look, I know that sounded like Dave can't read, it, right? But that was one sentence. And it was eight lines on a Google Doc. Oh, okay, run on, run on, run on. Yeah, it, it, right. the thing is, I speak English. and I'm, I, Yeah, that's not English. Yeah, I'm somewhat literate. My parents are married. Uh, I don't know what the hell that means. Matt so, just got the joke, the, the legitimate joke. To break it down, <laughs> it, it, the amendment would revise current law by subclassifying forest land conservation use property for ad valorem tax purposes, and it would change the method that we use to establish the value of forest land. Um, basically, this was pushed um, by a couple of bigger timber companies who have thousands and thousands of acres in different counties and different counties have over the past um, been able to set their own rates so if you have like land that goes across two counties your tax rates would be different in each county um, not just because of the millage rate but because of how they actually calculate it and what kinds of breaks they give you so they're changing that and I'm I you know I can't say for certain that it's not um, going to be better, but if it's pushed by big businesses and only big businesses, then I'm inclined to believe that, you know, most people don't push for a law because they think it's going to help everyone. <laughs> when you have a lot of money and a lot of skin in the game, there's usually a reason that you want something to be crafted from the way that it is in your favor. Um, and on top of that, um, it's also going to have all of the money collected by the state through the Department of Revenue and then given back to the counties instead of the counties just collecting the money and spending it how they need. So in rural counties, like where I am, it's actually going to hurt them because, you know, they are instead of getting their payments as they come in or as people pay their taxes every year, it's going to come in lump sums from the Department of Revenue when they process it, which is just... You know, there's a cost associated with that. It's just like when we send our gas tax to the feds, they take a little off the top and send us back less and don't actually do anything. They're just administering something. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. So I'm a firm no. Skimming off the top, Matt, sounds like the mafia. Right? No, I'm a no on this one just because of the way the damn thing was written. Like, if you can't write it, you know, for me to vote on it in something that resembles even vaguely a coherent thought. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a no on it. I'm going to be right where I was on Amendment 1, which is... Boo! The legislature <laughs> has the authority and responsibility to levy taxes, and they hold the purse strings. If they want to change something in the law, they can do that. 
Now, as far as creating a an obtuse process where it, it makes it difficult on these counties to, to collect money that is due to them. I mean, it really is mafioso because they're stealing the money anyway. And it, they're having to kick the money up the chain as, you know, you know, to Guido up the chain to, to keep him happy. <laughs> so it's a, it's a constitutional extortion ring and the state wants their cut. Right. So I, I'm a no on this for many reasons. And I, I don't even know if there's anything if it's worth diving any further into it. Well, so four. Um, oh, sorry, well, Jessica. No, I was just going to say another thing, the reason to be against it is it's supported by Governor Deal. So Governor, let's make a deal. Someone said that on my Facebook post today. And he listens to this podcast, and I just want him to know that it was one of the funniest things I heard all week. Governor, Dude. let's make a deal. So. And this is only for timber land. That's right. The Georgia Forestry Commission pushed this. And I found it quite compelling that, you know, it says one of the quotes um, after it passed was from the the CEO of the Georgia Forestry Commission, he said, for more than a hundred years, the Georgia Forestry Association has been instrumental in timber tax legislation, which has positioned the state as a global leader in forestry. Thanks to the leadership of our elected officials and Governor Deal, we can once again ensure that our tax policy supports the growth and vitality of our working forests and the communities that depend on them. Now, timber is, I mean, agriculture is our number one Right, timber's huge in your in your area. Well, it's the number one like actual commodity in our state, so I understand why it's important. But and I'm not advocating for people who use timber as a tax shelter, which a lot of people do. I, I don't want them to get ripped off. I just don't understand why the state has to be involved. I mean, this is like you own land. You don't own land that's governed by the state. All of your property taxes otherwise go to the local level. So why are we why are we bringing the state into this? I just don't understand. It's just a power grab. Well, it, it are is, we bringing the state into it or is the state interjecting itself? Well, I don't bring the state into anything, so I guess they're injecting themselves. Well, and they are injecting themselves into a single industry. Now, it, I understand right. it's the largest, but is a single industry and in creating a constitutional amendment for a single industry and, and it, it it feels odd to me to do that well and people just don't understand the the severity and the the power behind amending the constitution like it might sound like a good idea but you're amending a governing document i mean how many times i don't think any georgia constitutional amendment maybe other than one has ever been repealed. And even at the, the national level, we've had one amendment be repealed. I mean, it's not like this is an easy once. <laughs> yeah, that took us two years to figure out we messed up with right. that. Right, I mean, and the process is slow and then people just don't take it serious enough because they think that, you know, well, we have our Bill of Rights, this is just a little extra, whatever happens, but you cannot change this. Like, it's hard enough to repeal a law. This, this isn't gonna get changed. None of this is gonna get changed. It will be like this forever and ever and ever. And when they don't write them in a concrete way like they have with number one and number three and number four like we're about to talk about, you know, you leave it up to the interpretation of the next administration, which may not be the people who believe the same as you. I.e., look at the Second Amendment. Look how the Second Amendment is interpreted. Why would we want to have more things open to interpretation? Just codify something, make it law if you want it to be law, and then you can change the law if there's a problem. Can you imagine being in the room creating the Second Amendment, saying, what, what stronger words can we use? Ah, shall not be infringed. There's no way anybody could misconstrue, misconstrue that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yet here we are. Yet here we are. No, just got, I, I, I agree with you. I, and Matt, I agree with you too. I mean, it's, it is possibly the worst wording 
I mean, it's, it's hard to read. It's painful to read. Uh, I, I want to grab a red pen and correct it. <laughs> right. <laughs> this thing was supposed to be written by lawyers. <laughs> right, guys that presumably have a very good command of the English language. Huh. huh. No, what happens with all of these is lobbyists get involved and they offer to interpret it for you. Well, like, you can tell just by that guy. I'm sorry I may interrupt you, but the, the Georgia Forestry Commission, they are a lobbying organization. Like, in a, they have a lobbying arm. They have a representative who is pushing all of this. Right. It, it's, it's what they wanted, and they had it happen. It became a thing. It became and a thing. It became a thing, and now we're stuck with this thing, and things aren't good. Man, I bet, though, there's going to be a lot of... I bet that one doesn't pass. Because I bet there's going to be a lot of people that look at that and they're like, what the hell does that know? Just no. They don't read them. Some people do. I, I, could, I could just see... It really would be... A, a, you couldn't do it, but... Uh, watch people's reactions to reading that amendment. Is go through and right where <laughs> right. they get to uh, Amendment Three, and just watch their faces just contort. Just what did I just read? Right. What the hell does this say? Right. You, you want to raise your hand in the booth and go? Excuse me. Uh, uh, can Can someone translate this to English? Right. Can you mansplain that to me? <laughs> So number four, my number. least favorite one. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended so as to provide certain rights to victims against whom a crime has allegedly been perpetrated and allow victims to assert such rights? Jessica. It's a hard no. And I'm not the only one that thinks it this time. Um, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation did an analysis on this before it ever... Um, became a proposed piece of legislation in Georgia opposing it because of how dangerous and loose the language is and how there are unintended consequences. But basically, um, this amendment is a nationwide effort to notify victims um, of crimes of different sorts when they're, you know, to no notify them of court dates and probation hearings and parole possibilities and all kinds of things like that to keep them informed. Now, this is a constitutional amendment. It, this practice is already law. It's just some court systems don't do it. But the district attorney and the victim ad, victim's advocate's office in most of these counties already has a duty to notify these victims, especially if it's like, you know, an, a, a sex crime or crime against a child or something like that. They're not doing it. So apparently they think that if they put it in the Constitution they'll do it and personally I think that's ridiculous because a lot of times it's not it's like a staffing problem or a funding problem of why these victims are not getting notified not because the district attorney's office in a rural area is just like oh well you know good luck hope you have a gun I mean they're it's not they're not trying to like put people in the path of of danger so the Georgia Public Policy Foundation uh, which is a nonpartisan group voice their opposition to this one because it's you know so well funded it's an, a national effort that is working to change constitutions all around the country and two because it could increase attorneys costs and costs for support staff for victims which is one of the reasons that this isn't already happening as law it can risk infringing the on the rights of someone who's in, accused of a crime accused not convicted it can increase the false, um, the number of false accusations because there's more protections for victims. And it could also um, put an accused person in a position where they actually lose their right to be presumed innocent until they're convicted. Um, I found it really powerful how succinctly the Georgia Public Policy Foundation put this, this in their article. They said, a constitutional amendment is no place to risk infringing the rights of someone accused of a crime. The accused have the presumption of innocence until convicted. Their life and liberty are at stake. 
For many suffering victims and their surviving families, there's a fine line between justice based on a court of law and vengeance based on the alleged wrongdoing. And they were just talking about how we shouldn't be making constitutional amendments on a motion. And I felt like that was the most powerful way to, to voice your opposition. This isn't about being anti-victim. It's about we don't, we don't make this kind of decision based on a motion. Well, Matt, did the TV commercial sway you? I haven't seen the TV commercial. I don't. I'm a I'm a cord cutter, so none of my none if of my you TV has read all on Georgia every day. You would have seen how I said it was misleading and false. Yeah, well, you can be just buying well, your he, oranges, he and the bad guys right behind you. Yeah. So this <laughs> TV commercial that they put out was. It was put out by Marcy's Law for Georgia, which is an organization that's registered because they have so much money. Um, and it, it shows these women in like parking decks or at the grocery store and they see their, their attacker. They're just there or whoever hurt them or harmed them. And they're just there in public and they're caught off guard. And so, I mean, it is an emotional ad. And the voiceover says that you know, it's time for equal rights, as if victims of crime don't have constitutional rights. But in reality, everyone has constitutional rights right now. What they're lobbying for is for victims to have more constitutional rights than anyone. Which, you know, the whole animal, one animal's more equal than others. But I just... I, I was not pleased with the ad saying that it implies that victims of crime currently have less than equal rights because that's not true. And this is going to appeal to emotion and women and people who are scared and ugh. Right, this one's, I, I think this one will pass overwhelmingly. Ugh. Well, we covered it last week. It's all in how the summary is written. Totally. Uh yeah, you know, of course, I think we're all in agreement. I'm a hard no. One being a constitutional amendment, and, I, and Jessica, you pretty, put that pretty well as far as we should take that very seriously. Uh, secondly, it has the word alleged in there. And if the last two weeks watching the Senate confirmation should scare anybody is... Allegations can come from anywhere. Uh, you can be falsely accused. So, if someone looks a lot like Matt Lowe, uh, harms me, now uh, Matt somehow has uh, is disadvantaged. You know, he can't go to the same grocery store I can, or, or whatever, whatever it is. That now, besides having to defend a false a allegation is his rights are limited. Right. You know, well, and you talking about the language again, I mean, you read it, but it says, so as to provide certain rights to victims against whom a crime has allegedly been perpetrated. I mean, who is going to say no to that? See, here's the thing that I find interesting about that is like this, I, I think, I mean, you're talking about crimes you know where there's actual victims right like this should be important right and there is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten what 25 words in the whole question right but on this stupid freaking number three you know about taxes for a damn forestry service land it's it's an incoherent babble. Like, I would think that you would dedicate eight lines to explaining how this this uh, Marcy's Law thing would go down. If, if I don't know, man. I, I, it seems like they, you know, they glossed over it because, it's, you know, just, oh, we're just going to make a, a short little bullet point here about what it is. And... Well, and, and you probably should have, they should have done, gone a little deeper. There's a district attorney in South Georgia who's commented on this, and he acknowledged that it's already part of the law in Georgia. But his quote was, you know, I think 
having it in the Constitution gives peace of mind to prosecutors. So we're going to change the Constitution to give somebody a peace of mind. Like, that's even more ridiculous to me. And I don't know. Interestingly, some of the like trial lawyers groups and and legal people have voiced concerns. They haven't come out in opposition because I probably not a smart thing to do given where so many of their donations come from. But um, they've voiced concerns about how how much it can put someone's due process in jeopardy. Yet. Right. Our lawmakers are like, hey, this is a great idea. Feelings, feelings, feelings. Yeah, no, it definitely it definitely tugs at the heartstrings. And again, it has Governor Deal all over it because Brian Robinson is the communications director for Marcy's Law for Georgia, and he used to work for Governor Deal before he left and started his own money-making consulting firm. So, I mean, it's just the same old people pushing the same old crap all the time. And I don't understand why Governor Deal would support something like this when he's supposedly Captain Justice Reform. <laughs> and, you know, I, in the same vein, I, I don't like public mug shots. I don't like perp walks. Uh, before anyone is convicted, I don't, I don't like letting them be tried in the, in the uh, public arena. We have, a, we have a process for that, and you are innocent until proven guilty. And Unless. I actually had a, a, an attorney correct me on that one time. He said that, that, the, that the proper phrasing is innocent unless proven guilty. Because to use the word until implies a foregone conclusion. That's true. Hmm. Look at the big brain on Matt. <laughs> and he is spent for the rest of the episode. Right, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. See y'all next week. Number five. Shall the Constitution of Georgia be amended so as to authorize a referendum for a sales and use tax for education by a county school district or an independent school district or districts within the county having a majority of the students enrolled within the county and provide that the proceeds are distributed on a per student basis among all the school systems unless an agreement is reached among such school systems for a different distribution. So I literally had to read this like four times and then I had to read the bill and the enabling resolutions to understand what the hell they're trying to do. They're trying to get a sales tax. Yeah. So they want, so when you have more than one school district in a county, like City of Marietta and Cobb County, Atlanta City Schools and Fulton County, they want to be able to levy an additional sales tax. And they divide it up between the two based on population of everyone. Right. So, in places like Atlanta, your sales tax could be 9 or 10%, which is insane. I mean, I'm... It's already 9% in Fulton County. Not everywhere, though. Well, same thing in Cobb County. You have Marietta City Schools. You have Cobb County Schools. Uh, man, I... If we're at a 9 or 10% sales tax, we shouldn't have... An income tax in the state. Amen. If if that's if we want to put a constitutional amendment together about sales tax, let's eliminate the income tax and go to a consumption tax. Well, look, and this is specifically about school districts. So eliminate the damn property tax. Oh no, I mean I agree with you, but that's like people be marching in the streets against that. But. What's really ridiculous is that this passed part down party lines in the Senate, thirty three seventeen, Republicans all in favor and Democrats against it, and Ellis Black, who's from South Georgia, was a sponsor, and he was quoted in an interview saying that 
It was designed to put provisions in place that a school system with a majority of full-time equivalent students can place a renewal of East Floss on the ballot before voters without having to ask all of the systems within a county. So basically, a bigger school district could levy on the whole county, but not ask Atlanta or Marietta or vice versa. And he said it was also designed to prevent a smaller school system from essentially blackballing a larger school system within the county from passing a resolution um, and stop larger school systems preventing smaller systems. So basically allowing them to act independently, but you're going to end up with two taxes. Where did we get upside down and backwards? 1776. Yeah, the, the Democrats are voting against a tax hike. <laughs> Yeah. The minute we put the guns away, you know, that's when shit went sideways. I mean, it's just, but like we've talked about, if you had a Democrat governor, our Republicans would be all sporting Rand Paul curls and walking around with a Liberty drum. Right, man, there's part of me that... It's like, you know, it might be good for the state for Abrams to win. <laughs> um, sweet, sweet gridlock. Yeah, I'm going to choose gridlock and go down the con down the ballot a little bit to have some Democrats. I don't really want her. Because, <laughs> I mean... Just because people are never going to shut up. The school districts are like having a brother addicted to coke. No matter how much money you give him, he's always broke. He always <laughs> needs just a little more. And I, well, I think, it's I think just I said, like, I mean, it's the teacher pays everything that we've talked about with education. When is enough enough? When do we say, I mean, we've capped the millage rates at 20 mils across the state. So uh, uh, the education portion of your property taxes cannot exceed 20 mils. Well, there's plenty of districts around the state that have it at 20 mils that also have this East Bloss that also, you know, if, if you don't, if you can't reach 20 mils, like in some of our rural counties, you get equalization money from the state, which is basically a redistribution of wealth from the wealthier counties. I mean, then you get federal money, then you get state funds for certain programs and free lunch and all this. And the the amount of money that flows into education and yet they still want another penny sales tax and because they're saying they're getting cheated and we're still turning out crap right i mean look if you were to look at graduates as a product has the product uh gotten better in the last hundred years or worse well i turned out all right Eh. <laughs> You're a millennial. But but part of the, you know, I spend a lot of time in the schools with all on Georgia and it is concerning the lack of skills, not education. I have no doubt some of these kids can read a book and tell you what it's about and regurgitate some of the anatomy stuff and physics and math. But skills they Soft don't have skills. any skills. They can't do anything. They can't fend for themselves. I don't... You know... They can't fend for themselves. We got, we're getting a, a new career academy in Paulding County. I was at the groundbreaking the other day. And it's a... I know it's not a new concept. It's something that, that we worked for out here. Is to take some of these kids and... Get them some skills in some area they want to go. Whether it's nursing or cybersecurity... A couple other things they're going to do out here, uh, and and give them the opportunity to come out of high school with a with an associate's degree. I just wish there was some sort of soft skills class. Show up on time. Show up ready to work. Shake somebody's hand. Look them in the eye. Uh, Return a phone call from a potential employer with a phone call and not a text message. Right. I had that happen. Well, recently, and it's I, you know, I don't blame the local school districts for the lack of skills. I mean, I don't know when they would squeeze that in because they are told so much garbage that they have to do. I mean, recess is short, lunch is short, 
all this other nonsense is not short and so I, I'm not sure when they would fit in the stuff that we find important and the communication skills and that kind of stuff. That's, well, that's man, we had when I was in school it, it was called like there was home economics and right. then there was there was uh, business econ that I took in middle school, right? right. And that was where they taught in home economics. They taught basic things like I don't know how to balance a checkbook. Um, they also taught you know how to cook a meal. Um, I made pizzas off of English muffins. Where you put tomato sauce and cheese and pepperoni on like a open English muffin in the oven and broiled it. And I was like the right. proudest ever in sixth grade that I could fend for myself like kids these days don't even have that kind of sense of accomplishment like hey i just totally did something all on my own i sewed a pair of pants or i built something with my hands i mean they can't do that well i don't think that's the local district's fault no well that's mommy and daddy when it comes to that or yeah it is the lack of both of them you know my mother my father also taught me how to cook my grandmother taught me how to cook uh, long before I got to the school district, I was, you know, standing next to him at the stove, l- learning that kind of stuff. But he's on the green egg at age three. <laughs> we are an egg family, and yes, I did stand next to my father at the grill, and my job was to fetch him beers. Right. <laughs> but you know the, and it's not the local school district's fault. It. That's going to make me unpopular with a lot of people with R's after the names, but it's W that did this, that took us from teaching students to they better learn the test or you're going to learn, lose your funding. Right. Right. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the Federal Department of Education should not exist. Defund it. Destroy it. Let local school districts do their thing. You know, the, the teachers here in Paulding County know best how to educate the kids of Paulding County. So, I guess we're all a no on the amendment? I mean, can you can you put a capital N-O when you vote? I mean, can you just smash the machine? Yeah, no. Man, if they want to add that little caveat at the end that says this also strips... Every county of the authority to levy a property tax, man, I'd vote for that. <laughs> so, good luck with that. Um, I know we're kind of running short on time, but I did want to bring up we we have a guest next week who has some opposing views from us, and this is on education. So I wanted to kind of bring it up so that we could all be on the lookout in the news as it kind of unfolds. But we've talked about like transgender and and school policies and state and federal and all that kind of all blending together and with a democrat coming on the show i want to get her perspective but there's a school district who um allowed a five-year-old boy to use a girl's bathroom and ended up assaulting a little girl in the bathroom because i don't know why but he was in there when she was in there and so now the school district the department of education at the federal level is investigating and of course there's gonna be a lawsuit and to say the school did not prevent, take all measures to prevent this from happening. But it speaks to this problem we have of local control and when do we let the local districts just do what they want because right now the, you know, the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for this investigation and the lawsuit because a local district decided, hey, we're going to let boys use the girls' bathroom. Well, this goes back to Matt's thing from last week, which is that that principal should be drug out of the office and beaten to a pulp for the response that I think it's a she had to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the assault, which is no, we're not changing our policies. Right. Willful ignorance, I think, is what they call it. But man, I'm just like. Where'd that happen? Decatur City schools. Oh. And, uh, well, I, I see that because you know what would happen if that went down in Baldwin County <laughs> with one of my kids. That headline would have been like Matt Lowe beats the crap out of school principal. And you would never find twelve people in this county to convict you. 
Nope, I wouldn't even have to worry about bail. You might even get promoted on the Planning and Zoning Commission. <laughs> right, to czar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, when I first read the story, I was... sort of uh, uh, rolling my eyes like a five-year-old assault and then I watched the interview with the mother and it's worth watching it's on all in Georgia Um, we'll put it on our page yeah it's it's this isn't this this mother does not come off like somebody who's looking for a payday Um, it's a it's a fairly horrific story with how the school district responded uh, with the hammer of government. It's, it's, it's definitely worth the read um, and, and worth the uh, uh, watching the, the 10 minute video. Cause uh, it put me off my feed tonight uh, before you know, I watched it before dinner. It, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing. It is. Um, but we'll, I want to bring that up next week because I think it's one of the times when there are a lot of Republicans who would like to see um, maybe a state policy. They It's all local until they don't want it to be local when their local districts aren't doing what they want. But my solution is homeschool your children. Get rid of public schools. Yes, shut them down. But I'll save that for next week when we have someone who's going to be so excited to hear me say that. So. I, vote, I vote we abolish this. <laughs> right. Well, go ahead and tell everyone who it is. Well, to your friend. Allison Feliciano, candidate for House District 19, uh, a district that often comes up on this podcast. Dun, right, dun, because dun. I live in it. And because <laughs> Paulette, we'll have to ask her her position on... um. Chris. Oh, Chris Severe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, we cannot uh, support you unless you've been subpoenaed and served by Facebook Messenger. Right. <laughs> so get out there and fight with them. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, she listens to this podcast and and uh, realizes the the gauntlet she's walking into with this. 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 So do we have any closing thoughts? We've talked about a lot tonight. This week. Etc. Matthew? Uh Don't see. forget to remind everyone about the panel. You should show up. Might learn something. I already know it all. You tell us every week. <laughs> When's the panel? October 13th. Patagonia Buckhead, five o'clock. Are you buying chops after? Ah, uh, if you and Jessica show up, I will. Oh, I can run up a tab of chops, Hoss. Your kids may not eat next week. That's fine. I'll, I'll kill a deer. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, any closing thoughts? Yeah. Um, not really. It's just been a crazy week of corruption um i am filming a fox segment on switching to a four-day school week which maybe at one point we could have casey from all in georgia on here because she's a big advocate for that but i'm i'm a fan of that you are i am me too um but um yeah it'll be it'll be coming out soon i'm excited about it because it's gonna ruffle a lot of feathers but it, once again, it's something that the Democrats are in favor of having kids in school fewer days, while the Republicans in a lot of these counties that are doing it are like, no, 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 cradle to grave. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. So. What are the parents going to do? I don't know. Parent? <laughs> They'll figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. yeah, and and two thirds of the show have no kids. And Matt makes up for us. Dude, right? I've got enough for everybody. We're all yeah. paying hey. to send Kat, Matt's kids to school. That's right. You're welcome. Actually, man, now that I think about it, what is the average 
What's what's the average family? We're like two point five. Good radio right here. Let's see. <laughs> uh, it's oh, the average household is two point six. Average household is yeah. Well, that that number's been skewed by the number of single parent households. The average family consists of three point one four people. So that's interesting. I more than make up for y'all. Thank you. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, you Dave, know, I have uh, two thoughts. One is <laughs> when, <laughs> when people two? sum up uh, these amendments or anything you're voting on, consider the source. Read it for yourself. Do your own research. And I know the listeners to to this podcast do. Uh, they're obviously the smartest people in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> not to pander, but keep listening. Right. And, you know, the other is, and we've said it before, not to get entrenched with my side and your side. Uh, you know, I made mention of it earlier about you guys making intelligent uh, observations about the Supreme Court nominee and venom coming out from both sides. And it, it's amazing that semi-intelligent people can put up a cogent thought and all you get are a bunch of pitchfork-bearing, torch-carrying mobs saying, you're obviously not on our team. Politics is not a team sport. It's not, it's, it's not sitting down on a Saturday watching your team play and being mad when they lose. It's about moving our country in the right direction, which, and as far as freedoms go, means going backwards and giving our, getting our freedoms back, personally. But now that I've been on my soapbox and wasted more of everybody's time, thank you guys for having me again. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> and with that, later. Bye.